As always, a few uh, requests for you tonight. Please turn off your cell phones right now. If you have a question after the uh, interview session uh, is uh, complete, please raise your hand and wait for one of our students to bring a microphone by. We like that not only so everyone can hear the questions, but also so that well, we're able to get it on videotape. And we will put this on our website, and it should be up in a day or two. Uh, and also, if you do get an opportunity to ask a question, please ask a question. No filibustering allowed. Uh, to introduce our guest tonight, our Associate Director here at the Dole Institute of Politics, Professor John Earl. John? Good evening. Thanks for braving the cold. Not that bad out there, though. Tonight's guest is a lawyer who, in his last job, had to represent the government of the United States in front of the Supreme Court 49 times in some of the most important cases of the last decade, including those dealing with the war on terrorism. As United States Solicitor General, a job that has been called the Tenth Justice due to the relationship of mutual respect that inevitably develops between the justices and the SG, Paul Clement advocated a legal position based on the political positions of the president and filed briefs in every case of significance for the federal government, regardless of whether the government is directly involved. The numbers that I heard uh, Paul talk about recently of, of the cases that he is involved in are, are truly staggering. This is not, dare I say, an easy job. Due to the high degree of legal ability and expertise required for the position of Solicitor General, the office is generally considered to be the highest office for a practicing lawyer in the United States, even including the office of the Attorney General, which, while always held by a lawyer, is more of an administrative political office. It's no surprise that many who have worked as or for the Solicitor General have later been appointed to the Supreme Court. Paul Drew Clement was nominated by President George W. Bush on March 14, 2005 as Solicitor General and took the oath of office on January 13 of that year, replacing Theodore Olson. He served in the position for three years before returning this past year to teaching and then to private practice. A native of Cedarburg, Wisconsin, Clement received a bachelor's degree summa cum laude from Georgetown and a master's in economics from Darwin College at Cambridge University. He graduated magna cum laude from Harvard Law School, where he was the Supreme Court editor of the Law Review. After graduation, he clerked for Lawrence Silberman of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit and for Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, Antonin Scalia. He also worked at the law firms of Kirkland and & Ellis and King and & Spaulding, where he headed the firm's I need another hand. appellate practice as a partner. Clement joined the United States Department of Justice in February 2001. As Solicitor General, he argued many of the key cases in lower courts involving challenges to the President's conduct in the war on terrorism and cases before the United States Supreme Court, including Rumsfeld v. Padilla, United States v. Booker, Hamdi v. Rumsfeld, Hamdan v. Rumsfeld, and Gonzalez v. Oregon. You can probably tell that if you don't want your name on a Supreme Court case, don't join the President's cabinet. Clement was routinely mentioned as a possible Supreme Court candidate in John McCain in a John McCain presidency, and last fall was a coveted potential hire among D.C. legal firms vying to build on his expertise in appellate matters. One colleague said that, quote, Paul Clement is the holy grail of law firm recruiting. The buzz in the legal world about Clement is like the buzz in basketball, I can't believe this, when LeBron James was coming out of high school and turning pro. It will be interesting to see where the market will go. That's a great quote. This past November, Clement re rejoins King and Spaulding, and I doubt he will tell us where the market went. Interviewing General Clement is longtime friend of the Dole Institute, Steve McAllister. A professor in the law school and former clerk to two Supreme Court justices, Steve also served as the dean of the law school and interim director here at the Dole Institute in 2003 and 2004. He is also Solicitor General for the great state of Kansas, and in this capacity, I had the pleasure last month of seeing Professor McAllister argue a case in front of the Supreme Court. Suffice it to say that he was the best prepared, most articulate, and coolest customer appearing before the bench that day. It is my pleasure to welcome to the Dole Institute not one, but two Solicitor Generals, Stephen R. McAllister and Paul D. Clement. Well, it's our, our pleasure to have Paul with us. I'm going to ask him several questions, and then we'll open it to the audience. Uh, and these questions cover a variety of topics, some about Solicitor General, some about the court, and maybe a few about some other things. But uh, let's start with one that I think you were actually asked at dinner. Uh, of the 49 cases you argued at the Supreme Court, have argued thus far, uh, and you're probably not even uh, 
halfway through your career at the court yet. Uh, were there some that were particularly difficult to argue, and if so, why? Well, it's a great question, Steve, and um, I guess I would say a number of them were, were, were tricky cases. Every case has its challenge. Some have a particularly difficult record. Some have uh, just a problem inherent in the case that you really have to uh, spend a lot of time working with. I think of all the cases, though, the one that probably stands out in my mind as being the most difficult to argue in court was actually the, uh, the major campaign finance case, the McConnell against FEC case. And the reason that was such a difficult challenge really has a lot to do with Congress's action because Congress not only passed this comprehensive reform of the campaign finance laws, but because the opponents of the law in Congress really based their opposition on constitutional arguments, principally First Amendment objections to the statute, they wanted to ensure that there was a ready mechanism to challenge the statute when it passed. And so they put in a provision for expedited review to the Supreme Court, first sending the case to a three-judge panel and then giving an automatic appellate right to the Supreme Court. And, of course, as soon as the law was signed uh, by President Bush, um, a number of groups uh, challenged different provisions in the law on different constitutional grounds before the three-judge panel. That ended up taking an awful lot of time before the three-judge panel the three judges on the panel uh, issued four opinions, so that's usually not a good sign, and uh, that spans something like 1,400 pages. And we had to try to take that case and put it in a form that was manageable for the Supreme Court, which was, which was not easy. And then, of course, once it got up to the Supreme Court, it involved challenges to something like 14 different provisions by something like you know 15 different parties. And the way that... that uh, my predecessor and our colleague at one point in various different capacities, Ted Olson, uh, and I divvied up the case because this was when he was Solicitor General and I was the deputy in the office. Ted took essentially the major provision, which was the soft money provisions in the statute. I took the second sort of most significant provision, which was the limitation on corporate and union uh, campaign expenditures in the run-up to an election and everything else. Um, and you know, Ted was very, very clever, uh, as you know. So, so, so I had to basically get prepared in that case to 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 defend literally like 14 or 15 different provisions against constitutional attack. And one of the lawyers in the office at the time likened it to sort of defending the constitutionality of the tax code. You know, you weren't sure what provision they were going to ask you about, and you had to be ready because I don't know. I haven't thought about that yet. Is not a great answer in the Supreme Court. So that really was, I think, the biggest challenge, just because the scope of the case was so large. You know, the, the, I mean, just to read the district court opinion would take you, uh, you know, a good part of your, your, the time you would allocate to prepare for the argument. And then you had to make these strategic calls about, well, you, you pretty much guarantee that about 80 to 90 percent of the oral argument was going to focus on the major provisions in Title II dealing with union and corporate speech. But you really knew that about 10% of the questioning was going to be on other provisions, very difficult to know which ones were going to draw the justice's interest, and to try to allocate your time in preparing for the argument uh, among the main provision and these other provisions that we affectionately referred to as the cats and dogs um, was, it was a very difficult enterprise. Okay. Well, there's another <coughs> line of cases that I know have been very controversial in recent years, and those would be the cases involving the war on terrorism. And you argued several of those cases. Could you identify a few of those and, and talk a little bit about what that's like representing the United States in the Guantanamo and other such cases? Sure. Well, I argued a number of those uh, cases, both in the lower courts and in the Supreme Court. In the Supreme Court, I argued that the Hamdi case, the Padilla case, uh, both of which were, were claims by individual enemy combatants, individuals who were being detained as enemy combatants. Then I also argued the Hamden case, which was really more of a challenge to the military commissions um, down in Guantanamo. And then finally, the Boumediene case, which was, a, again, a challenge to the detention in Guantanamo, and particularly a challenge to a statute that Congress had passed to withdraw habeas jurisdiction and to provide a substitute remedy in the D.C. Circuit. And you know those were all cases where um, there was a real sense that these were cases that were politically charged. They were cases that were 
uh, you know, from a from a pure lawyer standpoint, kind of fascinating cases because you really didn't have a lot of precedent to go on. I mean, you had some precedents from analogous issues that the Supreme Court had issued really in the aftermath of World War II, and then you basically had nothing um, after that. And if you think about other areas of the court's law um, and how much of a change there's been, say, in just criminal justice jurisprudence, the revolution of the Warren Court, the partial response of the, of the Berger and Rehnquist Court, you know, all of that happened in the criminal justice um, area, and with respect to some of these war cases and war on terror cases, it's as if you have this you know time capsule that you've you know dug up that says 1950 and hasn't been disturbed since, and you're trying to you know ultimately I think part of the the the, the difficulty here was you know we would make the the administration would make judgments based on those Supreme Court cases. Um, we would typically do quite well in the litigation in the, the lower federal courts, which after all were bound by the World War II era Supreme Court precedents. And then, I guess perhaps not surprisingly in retrospect, when you got to the Supreme Court of the United States that was free to reconsider some of those precedents, um, you know, just as they had, have a very different view of criminal procedure than they did in 1950, they took a different view um, on, on, on some of these issues than, uh, than their predecessors had uh, you know, 50 or 60 years earlier. And, you know, part of that is probably the change in the jurisprudence uh, more broadly. And part of that is, I think, the real sense that on the part of the justices that although, you know, that I, I think they believe that, that this is, you know, a real war at some level, I think they also have an appreciation that this is a different war than a World War II or a more traditional war where there's going to be a fairly discreet beginning and a fairly discreet end, and I don't think that's necessarily going to be the case in the current struggle. So in, in cases like that, and in cases in general, can you talk a little bit about how the litigation, litigation position of the United States is determined, how that works in the SG's office and elsewhere, who participates, what's the process? Sure. Well, I, I guess in answering that, what I would focus on is, you know, to, to try to differentiate between the underlying policies that are undertaken and the legal defense of those positions. And, you know, if you're working in the Solicitor General's office and, you know, the, 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 the Defense Department and, you know, the, and, and, and others have taken action, say, to detain somebody's enemy combatant, they've probably done that in part based on advice from the Justice Department, but not necessarily advice from the Solicitor General's office. Typically, when you have a pre-litigation decision about the legality of proposed action, it's the Office of Legal Counsel that plays the primary role in advising government officials about the legality of their actions. And so, you know, in a case in, in this area, you know, as is typical of other areas, um, you know, you're often confronted with a policy decision that's been made by the policymakers, often done, you know, with some input from others at the uh, at the Justice Department, and then it gets involved in litigation. And th what I would basically say is the role of the SG's office is to really kind of direct the litigation, principally in the Supreme Court, but sometimes in the lower courts as well. But unless we reach a judgment that a position is just sort of, you know, going to be almost impossible to defend in the courts, I mean, it's really not open to us to say, geez, this is a lousy policy. I mean, you know, perhaps we could point that out in passing, um, but, but it's not the scope of our job to be able to sort of reconsider those fundamental issues of policy. Um, and, and, and to sort of put that in the context of a, maybe a less controversial area, you know, it's, from time to time I had this experience in government where somebody would come in and maybe they were representing a private party that was adversely affected by some government rule or regulation and the government rule or regulation had been challenged in the courts. Maybe it had been struck down and the decision was whether or not we should appeal that adverse decision or whether we should take the case to the Supreme Court. And you would have somebody who was adversely affected by the rule and didn't really like the rule on policy grounds come in and basically make a policy argument to us about why we should basically not defend the rule because it was a really lousy rule. Um, and you know the response that I would have in those situations is to basically give them the address of the agency that had promulgated the rule. 
and say, look, you know, if you can convince this agency to withdraw the rule, that's fine by me. I have plenty of other cases I can work on. But I'm not going to make an argument that I think is a viable legal argument uh, just because you don't like the policy. And to me, that you know, is, is, is a kind of critical division. It's, you know, the division's not always as neat and pretty as that. I mean, you, know, you have cases where the line between policy and legal argument is very blurred. But as, as, just as a way of approaching it and understanding the work of the office, I think that's a very important kind of division. Because I think if, you know, if people try to get the SG's office to make sort of surreptitious policy judgments in the guise of legal arguments, they end up getting both the policymakers and the SG's office into a lot of trouble. If people respect that basic division of authority, I think you know, the policymakers can make the policy judgments for which they're politically accountable, and the SG's office can make the legal judgments for which they're at some level politically accountable, at least the SG himself or presumably very soon herself. Well, and in that regard, we can talk a little bit about the independence or not of the SG's office. In a take a case like the District of Columbia, the Second Amendment right to to bear arms case, would would a decision on litigation position come from the White House? Does it come from the Attorney General? Where where does it come from the Solicitor General? How does that decision made? Well, I mean, you know, the Heller case. I mean, I'll, let's talk about the Heller case in a second. But in some ways, the Heller case. Was, was such a politically freighted case that it's probably not, you know, it, it's more an example of the exception rather than the rule. You know, as, the ru as more of the rule, um, in those situations where you can sort of, you know, kind of focus on a question as really being a legal question, um, usually, you know, in practice, the Solicitor General is going to have the final word um, because it's not that it would be illegitimate in my view anyways, if the Attorney General or the White House countermanded the legal conclusion of the uh, Solicitor General. I mean, if you look at the org chart, it's pretty clear that the Solicitor General works for the Attorney General and the Attorney General works for the President. And even on a legal call, you don't have to be you know, a, you know, a disciple of the High Church of the Unilateral Executive to, to concede that if the President really wanted to make that legal call for the Solicitor General, there's nothing illegitimate about that, again, at least in my view. I mean, the president was elected by the people, the solicitor general not so much. So, um, but, but that said, you know, the, 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 the solicitor general was appointed by the president. Um, solicitor generals, as a, as, a, as a group, it's a small group, but as a group are very fond of pointing out that the solicitor general is the only uh, executive branch official required by statute to be learned in the law. And what that means in practice is just that, you know, that really does define the job as being a law job. And if what you have is a pure legal question, you'd really hope that a president and an attorney general who had reposited their sort of trust in, 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 the, in the wisdom of the solicitor general would not routinely second guess legal judgments. So, and, you know, and, and, and as much attention as a case like Heller gets, it's the ERISA preemption cases and the, you know, the qualified immunity cases that are the bread and butter of the day-to-day -day work of the office. And it would be a horrible system if people were kind of second-guessing second and countermanding kind of legal judgments on a day-to-day -day basis. I think any solicitor general who found himself or herself uh, in that position ought not to hang on to the job real long. Um, a case like Heller becomes a different situation just because it is such a high profile issue it's a it, it, as the policy aspects of that I think would legitimately get to the level of the Attorney General or or the White House but I, I also think it's important even in a case like that for people to uh, you know appreciate the full scope of the various considerations that a Solicitor General takes into account in making that kind of judgment and I think it's in a case like that, it might be easy to say, well, you know, this is a Republican administration. Why aren't we taking a position that's more definitively on the side of the Second Amendment? And, I mean, you know, if the president ultimately wanted to do that, the president would be within, obviously, his rights to do that. But I think it would be important for him to understand that the consequences of that are not just, well, we're going to take this position in this brief in the Supreme Court. The consequences of that include the fact that over the course of his administration, individuals have been prosecuted under a variety of statutes 
that might not be defensible if the administration took a position that was very, very strongly uh, pro Second Amendment. And I think, you know, it's it's it, one of the roles that the SG plays, even in these kind of you know more politically charged cases, is to make sure that that people considering the issue really take into the full range of considerations that the SG's office does in every case, including the more routine. Do you think being, when you served as principal deputy uh, SG for several years prior to becoming the SG, do you think that those jobs are different in the Bush administration than in previous administrations or fundamentally the same and, and why? Well, you know, I, obviously I know the, the Bush administration better than any other administration. Uh, you know, I, I've read, you know, basically, you know, it's within one standard deviation of everything that's been written about the Office of Solicitor General. So, you know, I've read a fair amount about other administrations. And my sense is, you know, the, the, the jobs have worked a little differently in, in, in different administrations. Um, part of that is because, it, it, I mean, one thing to understand about the Solicitor General's office is that the principal deputy Solicitor General and the Solicitor General are the only two political appointees in the office. So all the other lawyers in the office are career lawyers who don't change from administration to administration. Um, that makes a world of sense if you consider that in all but a handful of the most controversial issues, the position of the, of the federal government is actually not going to change much between administration to administration. People obviously focus on issues like race or abortion or maybe the Establishment Clause where there are going to be changes. And of course, elections have consequences, and those are the kind of issues that figure in elections. But most of the day-to-day -day work of the office is on issues where the positions aren't going to change. One role that I think, to one degree or another, has been played in different administrations uh, by the principal deputy and, and the solicitor general is, you know, there's, there's a sense that people think, well, maybe this is the person who's supposed to enforce political orthodoxy on this important office staffed mostly by career lawyers. In practice, it ends up being pretty much the opposite, which is the reason you want to have a principal deputy or the solicitor general is you want somebody who, you know, broadly speaking, has some sort of sympathy to the policy goals of the administration, explaining why they can't do something they want to do consistent with the longstanding position of the, uh, of, of the solicitor general's office. If that message was being delivered by a career civil servant, I think it would be easier for people of one party or the other to kind of dismiss it and say, well, sure. I mean, that's just the, the kind of career folks talking, whereas if they have somebody who's got some uh, political you know, sympathy, um, then it's making that same message, I think it's carried a, a lot more. Now, so I think that's one role that one level or another is, is the same across administrations. I think one thing I've noticed that's different is, um, you know, President Bush was not an attorney. And so I think there were actually on the issues in the SG's office, um, actually a pretty fair degree of deference to the positions that the office took. You could point to a case like Heller, a case like the Michigan Affirmative Action case, where I think it, the issue was so politically salient that, that, that there was certainly going to be involvement. But I think on, on the day-to-day -day basis, there just wasn't that much involvement. And if you read you know, some of the things that, that Walter Dellinger um, or others have said about the Clinton administration, I think there you had a president who was a constitutional law professor, was very interested in these issues, and I think it was a lot more hands-on and I think that, in turn, changed the role of the, of the principal deputy and the solicitor general at that. Yeah, well, that kind of leads into another inquiry. There was a story in the New York Times, I think, just on Friday about <clears throat> the Obama administration and several positions they've already, at least for now, are taking, in essence, the same position as the Bush administration, particularly in surveillance and state secrets and various cases that are pending in the lower courts right now. And so I'm curious if you think the Obama Department of Justice will be significantly different than the Bush Department of Justice in terms of a lot of the positions or not? And, and if there are differences, where will those differences be? Well, I, I certainly think there are going to be differences, but I guess I would say that I think from the, the perspective of the general sort of, you know, non-lawyer, non-Justice Department alum kind of perspective looking at what happens, I think from their perspective, there's maybe going to be less change than they expected. And I think part of the reason is that, 
you know, I mean, what's true of the Justice Department, uh, rather what's true of the Solicitor General's office is to a certain degree true of the Justice Department as a whole. I mean, you know, you're going to have uh, some of the top political jobs are going to change hands, but the career people who do the work day to day are going to be the same people in the Obama administration as in the Bush administration. And, you know, I think there's a tendency to, for people to think that on some of these issues, and, you know, especially tangentially related to the war on terror, like the invocation of state secrets privilege in the face of a challenge to a surveillance program, people s tend to think that that's, you know, sort of the creature of, you know, the, the Bush administration. And what they kind of fail to appreciate is there are career lawyers that have been dealing with state secrets issues from Democratic administrations to Republican administrations. You know, they see the political people come, they see the political people go, and there's a long-term interest in the federal government. I mean, you can't, I mean, you know, we can have a, a healthy debate, and I'm sure so, at, uh, one of these nights at the Dole Institute there will be a healthy debate about whether you should have clandestine programs at all or you should even, you know, have a CIA. But if you're going to have one, and you're going to have some programs that are clandestine, it's pretty hard to do that and not have some kind of state secrets privilege in court. Um, and, you know, and I think the, the career people at the Justice Department who've been defending the CIA in litigation year in, year out, um, they understand that and, you know, and they were involved in the decision-making process that led to the assertions in the Bush administration. They're the same lawyers that are there and are probably going to you know, argue some of those cases in the courts. So to expect a radical change in position there I think is a mistake. You know, does that mean that the Obama administration is going to invoke the privilege quite as much as the Bush administration? Probably not. I, I think there will be something of a change there. But the idea that they're going to abandon it kind of wholesale or really cut back in a way that's going to be a real sea change, I would doubt it. And to answer the second part of your question, you know, where are you likely to see the biggest changes? I think you are probably, you know, kind of, if you look, take a little bit more of a historical perspective, the positions that tend to change the most are, you know, I mean, race cases are ones where I think, you know, the two parties have fairly different views about the degree to which you want to have race neutral or race, you know, race conscious programs, especially when the, when the programs are designed to help uh, racial minorities. They have different views on those issues. Um, the, that's, that's an area where the policy issues and the, pol and the legal issues are really kind of joined at the hip. And so, you know, at the beginning of the Clinton administration, they changed gears in the Piscataway case. Uh, you know, and there, I think that's an area where you probably will see some difference in this administration as well. Um, you know, if, there, if there's, uh, you know, an abortion case that gets to the court, probably see a different view than you might have seen in the Bush administration. And so some of those issues are the ones I'd look for. But on some of these core, you know, national security issues, issues about executive uh, power, um, I think there's going to be probably more continuity than most people are expecting. Okay, well, let's, let's shift gears just a little bit and talk about the Supreme Court itself, perhaps, uh, for a few minutes. Who, who do you think may be some of the top candidates to be a, a justice uh, nominated by President Obama? Well, it's, I mean, it really is difficult to answer that question in the abstract because um, I think it's going to depend a great deal on why there's a vacancy. Um, and uh, if there's a vacancy, for example, because Justice Ginsburg steps down, I mean, I think that, you know, almost all of the focus of the shortlist is going to be on, 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 on female candidates. I think it's almost unfathomable that if Justice Ginsburg is the first to retire, that she would not be replaced by a female candidate. Um, and so, you know, that, I mean, you know, I think the, the Obama administration is blessed by the fact that, you know, they have a number of candidates who will be um, people that, you know, I, th I mean, I think, you know, there, there are a lot of female Court of Appeals judges. Uh, the Solicitor General uh, designate is, 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 is a female attorney, a dean of Harvard Law School, at least for another couple of weeks. Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, they have, they're going to have a rich roster of candidates to pick from. Um, but I think that's, you know, that's going to really drive the decision, um, in, at least in part in terms of the makeup of the list. If one of the other justices steps down first, I think, I think there's still going to be a lot of female candidates who will be on the short list, but I don't think it will be as much of a kind of imperative if that's the case. Um, and, uh, you know, and there obviously another kind of interesting issue will be the extent to which uh, one of the, the, the ultimate nominee is somebody who's currently on a court of appeals uh, 
or whether this is some they, they they take somebody from the state bench or whether they take somebody who's not in a in a judicial position right now and I guess uh, Chief Justice Roberts was out in Arizona at the Rehnquist Center a couple of weeks ago and, and mentioned that you know the fact that all nine justices are former Court of Appeals judges and the Chief Justice was making I think the case that that was a good thing um, and I think there's certainly others that think that maybe a little more diversity of uh, background um, would be you know advantageous for the court and of course you could have it both ways I mean you could have somebody who had a diverse more diverse background before they went on to the uh, the Federal Court of Appeals bench and then is promoted so okay, well you've argued enough cases I think to have a good feel for for the the justices currently there do you have any uh, quote favorite justices and I know you will have none that are not favorite since you're still right. in private practice and be appearing but but any any favorites or or any particular anecdotes you might want to share about any of them well all nine of them are definitely my favorite <laughs> so um, and uh, I would be foolish to answer otherwise what I what I can say is you know every one of the justices um, is you know is 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 a pleasure to appear in front of um, you know Justice Thomas is a pleasure to appear in front of because <laughs> 49 arguments into it he hasn't asked me a question and uh, you know and, and I haven't suffered for a lack of questions generally so that's not all bad um, and then all of the other justices have sort of you know distinct styles and the way they they question you and approach you and uh, you know I think I mean having clerked for Justice Scalia I think that um, you know I've had some of the more memorable interactions with Justice Scalia um, but I think that's also a product of kind of the way that he approaches oral argument. I mean, he is somebody who, you know, can occasionally uh, get a little sarcasm in some of his questions, get a little bit of humor in some of his questions. And I think as an advocate, it makes it a little bit easier to, uh, to, to answer, not entirely in kind and certainly never losing your full, you know, sense of, of decorum and respect, but there are things that I've said to, to, to Justice Scalia, you know, in, in colloquies in the court, that I probably wouldn't uh, say to uh, to another justice. One of my one of my favorite recent ones was I was arguing a case that implicated the issue of, of implied causes of action, and uh, and 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 there was Justice Scalia in a case. I think he's maybe said this more in one place, but had a particularly memorable sort of you know passage in a case called Sandoval where he talked about the court's prior tendencies to, uh, you know, in, you know in, in, in sort of the bad old days, to use his phrase, um, to imply or infer causes of action from statutes that didn't specifically say that a plaintiff could sue a defendant. Um, the statute would just sort of generally regulate and the courts would create a private cause of action. And he basically in Sandoval said, well, we used to do that, but we're basically not going to do it anymore. And so we were having a colloquy about a particular case and there was a little bit of confusion about whether that case was decided in the era in which the court used to infer private cause of action or, or later years and you know because he started asking the question and he uses this sort of colorful language about the bad old days and the good old days um, he asked me at one point midway through this colloquy well you know general clement when when do you when do you think when do you think the uh, the good old days or when do you think the bad old days ended um, and my response to him is, was, well, when you came on the court, Mr. Justice Scalia. <laughs> um, and um, that was probably a little cheekier answer than I might have given a, a, another justice. But in the context of the overall spirit of the colloquy, it seemed like it fit right in. <laughs> All right. Well, th this raises another point. I'd like to hear you talk just a little bit about what it's like to appear in front of him. Sort of describe, I guess, two things. Describe the actual experience, the argument experience, but also maybe talk a little bit about how you prepare for a case, what you do to get ready. Sure. Well, I mean, arguing a case in front of the Supreme Court, I think, is you know, about, if you're a litigator anyway, is about the kind of pinnacle of your professional career. As far as I, you know, I just think it's an incredible honor to appear in front of the justices. It's also an incredible exercise because you have at least eight of the justices who are going to be asking you questions uh, not premeditatedly designed to make you look good. Um, you know, they are going to be asking questions to unearth issues. Oftentimes, you know, it has been observed that the, that the justices who ask the advocates the most questions tend to vote against the advocate. Um, and there's the occasional softball in that, but uh, 
but you know it's a very challenging intellectual experience to engage with the justices and there really isn't much of a safety net I mean you you know you don't have somebody whispering answers in your ears you can't say well I'll get back to you I mean you know it's, it, you really do have to answer the questions and fully engage um, and then one of the things that makes it particularly tricky is that you know compared to I mean, you, all, you can have arguments in the Court of Appeals where you have, you know, great judges who are very engaged asking lots of tough questions, but they will, whatever their own views on the issue might be as a matter of first impression, they are, if there's a relevant Supreme Court precedent, uh, you can really focus the argument on what the Supreme Court meant in this particular case and whether you're on this side or that side of the line the Supreme Court laid down. In front of the justices, I mean, you know, they are free to basically reconsider all the way back to first principles some of the court's precedents. And some of the justices in certain areas of the law aren't all that impressed by the court's own precedents in that area. And it can create this very challenging dynamic, whereas the lawyer, one of, you know, you're, principally what you're trying to do is get to five justices to support the position of your client. And sometimes you know, there'll be a position that will very much appeal to three justices but no more than three justices. And so if you, know, if you put all your stock in that position, um, you're going to you know, have three justices who think you're absolutely right and are very satisfied with all your responses, but you're not going to do your client much good. Um, and then, you know, so sometimes in those kind of cases, you have to figure out, well, where would my fourth and fifth votes come? And sometime in giving answers that are designed to appeal to your fourth and fifth votes, you tend to disappoint the justices who are your core three votes. And you have to kind of walk that line in a way that I think doesn't really have a direct analog in a lot of other uh, arguments, just because the justices are sort of free to reconsider, to hold their ground, even if the, just, the, the other majority of the justices have gone in a different direction. And so walking that kind of dance is something that I think makes it such a, an interesting but you know, sometimes very difficult endeavor. Because it's so difficult to prepare for it, one of the things that I certainly do and feel you know, very strongly about is the need to do a couple of moot courts before I walk into the, to the, uh, the Supreme Court for the real thing, so to speak. There, there are one or two advocates out there that, 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 that don't favor moot courts, but from, from, from my standpoint, it's like the, you know, the American Express commercial, you know, don't leave home without it. I, I can't imagine walking into the Supreme Court of the United States without having done um, a couple of, of, of dry runs. And I guess, you know, the one thing I would say that maybe this is too much inside baseball, but at the risk I'll, I'll share it is, you know, I actually almost always do two moot courts, and I actually approach the two moot courts slightly differently. In the first moot court, I'm really trying to get my answer kind of all the way out and figure out whether the, the, the argument that I'm making in answer to the question really works. So what I'm not trying to do is get the argument out in short form and then transition to a stronger point. I'm really trying to lay out the argument and purposely not transition to something else because I want to get the benefit of that you know, collegial exercise with other people who are asking hard questions to see whether my answer really works and to see whether it works with the second and the third and the fourth follow-ups. By the second moot court, I'm a little more already into the mode that I would be at the real oral argument, which is you certainly answer the question and don't try to change the subject immediately. But once you answer the question, you don't want to spend the entire argument on the weakest points for your case. You want to find a kind of logical segue to a stronger point for your case. And so I kind of work on that in the second moot court as opposed to the first. And a couple other just maybe technical, but I think points of interest about an argument. Do you take anything with you to the podium and sort of what's your game plan when you approach the podium? How long do you think you'll have before they start asking questions and interrupting? <clears throat> Well, I, I generally don't take anything to the podium. Um, that's kind of a minority view um, and perhaps a, a, a crazy view. Um, you know, my own sort of you know, view on this is if you actually watch lawyers argue cases in the Supreme Court, none of them actually argue from notes because the interaction with the, justice is so, with the justices is so rapid fire, there's so many questions, that you don't have time to sort of fumble around in your papers and look for some you know, great tidbit. So the question is really not whether you argue from notes or not, it's what, what do you bring to the podium? And really, I think for most people, they might bring something, but it's, it's ultimately just kind of a security blanket. 
And my, my own view is, you know, I want to be so ready for the argument that I don't need a security blanket. So I generally walk up there, uh, you know, with, with, with nothing. Now, usually, you know, if it's, if it's a case with a huge sort of, you know, complicated statutory provision, you know, what I might, you know, have at, at least the side of the podium is the copy of the statute in the appendix to the brief so I can direct the justices to the statute at the relevant appendix or, or whatever. So it's not like, you know, under no circumstances would I take something up. But I generally uh, don't take anything up. Um, and, and then in terms of the actual dynamic of the argument, it is really, I mean, you know, I think the Chief Justice Roberts and the Roberts Court, you now maybe can get almost a minute um, of your thoughts out before you're going to get interrupted with questions. And once the questions start, generally they don't stop. Um, this may be, an ex just to give you a flavor for how many questions you can get, this is maybe an outlier, but uh, a, a friend of, 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 of mine who's in the office, David Salmons, who's uh, another Gibson Dunn alum, um, great lawyer, had a particularly tough assignment. Um, in arguing a particular case for the government. It was a tough position to defend. Um, he knew that going in. He had a 30-minute argument. Um, things did not go great. He, he, did, he did get a little fire from the justices. And so afterwards, I think as part of the, the, you know, the process of recovery, um, he, he went through the oral argument transcript and counted the number of questions that he got in a 30-minute argument. Um, and he got to 77 um, in 30 minutes. So that's a lot of questions. Um, and you really have to be, you know, understand that that's really what the argument is going to consist of, questions and answers. Uh, the tricky thing, though, is every once in a while, and I guess we, we were talking in the car on the way over, I mean, you saw this happen recently. Every once in a while, you're going to have a case where, for whatever reason, maybe your position is really correct, maybe your position is really wrong, maybe the justices are just still thinking about the prior case, but every once in a while, you will get up there and not really be interrupted for, you know, five or six minutes. And so, you know, one of the challenges for the advocate is you sort of have to go up there and approach the podium as if you need five or six minutes worth of things to say, um, but you have to also understand that you're very likely only be able to get your first point across. And so, you know, at least in my case, what I try to do is first start with the one point that, you know, if I can really get one point across, I want to start with that one point I want to convey. And then the other thing I do is to sort of, you know, in, in thinking about what I would say if I was not, um, if I was allowed to go for a while, I really think what I would like to say is some of the material I would like to get out in response to some of the toughest questions I'm likely to get anyways. And, and what that means in practice is that if I sort of have a conception of the five or six points I'd really like to make at the outset, if I had the opportunity, um, I almost never get a chance to make them because I'm almost always interrupted with questions, you know, very early in the presentation. But if the argument goes reasonably well from my perspective afterwards, I often have gotten the five or six points out in the course of answering the various questions. Well, a couple, couple of personal questions, and then maybe we'll open it up for some audience questions. Uh, have you enjoyed your career as a lawyer and in the law, and would you recommend the law as a career to current undergraduates, or would you encourage current law students? I mean, I, you know, I've enjoyed it probably to a fault. I, I just think it's, uh, it's just a tremendous amount of fun, I, and I feel like I've been very privileged to have the opportunities uh, I, I've had. I feel very privileged that you know, I, I happen to sort of live in a society that kind of places, some would say, undue weight on the skills that, you know, I was, I was, I was fortunate enough to be blessed with. So um, I've really enjoyed it. Um, and I guess, you know, the advice I would give to, to people, you know, at the, at the beginning of their, their studies or at the beginning of their careers is, you know, you should, you should definitely go to law school if you want to be a lawyer. Um, I'm not a big fan of the school of thought that says, I have no idea what I really want to be when I grow up, so I think I'll go to law school. Um, I just don't think, you know, I mean, I, I, it's not a terrible way to spend three years, um, but if you don't really want to be a lawyer, I'm not sure I see the point. Um, you know, you can maybe even make an argument for going to the first year of law school. Now I'm going to, I hope, that, is the dean still here? I might be getting myself into real trouble. But you can make, you can make an argument for if you just wanted a, a kind of an interesting intellectual experience to go to the first year of law school and then leave. But to go to all three years of law school, I mean, I think you really ought to want to be a lawyer. 
Um, there's all sorts of different ways to practice law. You can be a transactional lawyer. You can be a litigator. You can, uh, you know, do all sorts of things under the rubric of practicing law. But, you know, if I were giving advice to somebody who hadn't yet committed to, to, to law school, I think what I would say is, you know, try to talk to as many lawyers as you can um, and try to, you know, really figure out if, whether that's, you know, something that you'd like to do. And if you can find them, maybe talk to a few, you know, the so-called recovering lawyers who are now, you know, artists or managing restaurants and, you know, talk to them too. And if at the end of the process you think you might rather be an artist or a restaurant manager, I'd, I'd probably go right directly to that route instead of pass and go and stopping at law school. All right. Well, maybe one more before we open the floor for some questions. Uh, just curious, your reaction, your comments, what was it like to attend a basketball game at Allen Fieldhouse today? <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was a tremendous experience. Um, and I think part of that was the result, um, which was quite satisfying for uh, almost everybody in attendance. There are a couple of guys about three rows ahead that didn't seem so happy. But, um, but almost everybody seemed like it was great. It was a great result. And what a just unbelievable atmosphere. Um, and we talked about this a little bit at, at, at dinner, but I think my favorite was the, uh, the student section with, with you know, the John Brown uh, mural with the NCAA tournament in one hand and the <laughs> rifle in the other. I mean, that was, that was a work of creativity and art. It was. All right. Well, thank you very much. I think we're ready to open if there are any questions. He's right there. There it is. Uh, after the oral argument, do you in your mind uh, count votes? And if so, uh, how uh, are, are you able to predict outcomes very successfully? Well, you, I mean, I I in one level, you do count votes both before and after the, the oral argument. Because as I say, you know, what you're, what one simple way to define the job of the, of the advocate is to get to five for, for his or her client. And so in that sense, you know, you count votes when you're getting ready for the argument, you try to draw a judgment about who are your most likely votes, and if you know if 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 it's going to be hard for you to get five justices to adopt the single theory. I mean, so you know who who's your fourth and who's your fifth and who's your sixth and so on. And then obviously after the oral argument, you kind of reassess and get a sense of you know do you know do you think you have the votes and did it seem like some justices that were uh, you thought might not be sympathetic would be sympathetic and vice versa and all that but I think the other thing is I've learned from experience uh, not to put too much credence in what you see at oral argument certainly you know the most relevant tea leaves you have I suppose but it's still an exercise in reading tea leaves it's still very much an imprecise science and I've just seen too many cases where you look at the oral argument and you think, boy, the whole court's over here, and they end up over here, or you see, wow, you know, I, I, I didn't think justice so-and-so was going to be with me, and, you know, boy, those seem like sympathetic questions, and, you know, you read the final, you know, opinion, and that justice was just as much against you as you thought at the beginning. So I, I've kind of, if anything, I think as I've had more experience, I've probably placed less weight on what I hear at the oral arguments. You know, that said, you know, you know you, 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 it doesn't stop you from trying. I mean, you're, at the time you finished oral argument, you're so vested in a case. And, you know, you, I mean, you really do spend a lot of time thinking about what the justices said at oral argument, and especially if you think it's a case where it's very much up in the air, you know, you start, you know, did they split that infinitive on purpose? I mean, was it, were they saying something? Uh, and, you know, and usually the answer is no. Uh, hello. Uh, I haven't actually run the numbers, but I've heard that the uh, Roberts Court has more five to four splits um, as a relative proportion compared to earlier courts. And I was wondering if you had any hypotheses on why that might be true or any opinions on whether that's good or bad, that kind of thing. Yeah, and I, I mean, I haven't run the, the numbers myself, and I've seen very, but I have seen various numbers that kind of point in slightly different directions. Um, and, you know, if it depends on what snapshot you take, you can get slightly different numbers on that. I, I think what I would probably say is if, it, if there is, if there have been sort of a higher percentage of cases decided five to four, I think it probably is the case's fault, not the court's fault, which is to say if you look at the Roberts Court, it's not that radically different than the Rehnquist Court or the other courts before it. And, you know, people I think tend to focus a great deal on 5-4 cases and usually 5-4 cases and particularly 
kind of charged areas of the law. And if you actually look at the court's decisions in the docket as a whole, you know, you might be surprised by how many 9-0 decisions there are. Um, and, you know, in, in, in a lot of years, you know, this, the single number, largest number of cases are decided by a 9-0 vote, and then maybe the next is 8-1, and then the next is 5-4. Um, and so, you know, I think the 5-4 nature of the court, I mean, sure, surely this is a court that's relatively closely divided. On a number of these issues, Justice Kennedy seems to be the vote that is most likely to kind of be the you know, so-called swing vote. But beyond all that, I think it really just depends on the cases that are coming before the court. And, uh, and, and I guess, you know, I, I think it's probably, um, at least at this point, reading a little too much into the numbers to try to, try to you know, take it um, you know, too far in one direction or another. I mean, at the very beginning of the Roberts Court, um, Chief Justice Roberts gave an interview where he talked about unanimity and the importance of unanimity. Um, in the early part of his first term, the court had decided a disproportionate number of cases unanimously, and a lot of people were rushing around saying, wow, look at this, this unanimity stuff has really taken root. And then it's like just when they started saying that, the court just issued one 5-4 opinion after another. Um, then the, the, the first full term of the Roberts Court with Justice Alito on it, the court was bitterly divided at the end of the term in some cases involving partial birth abortion, race, and a few other issues. And people are like, you know, oh my goodness, look at this court, it's so bitterly divided. And then the next year, you look at the cases, and, you know, they're a little more unanimous and a little less 5 4, a few more 6 3s, all this kind of stuff. I just think that, you know, there's, you know, maybe in five years' time, when the Roberts Court has been together at least five years, we might be able to say something meaningful. But I think right now we're too early into it. The numbers have swung one way or another too much. I think it's probably just, you know, one term, they get a bunch of cases that divide them five to four. The next term, they take a bunch of cases where they're d seeing the, the issues um, a lot more similarly. I'm not going to ask you uh, to give your personal preference, but. Uh, you've done both government work and now you're in private practice again. I was wondering if you could compare and contrast those types of practices, especially for the law students that are here tonight, as they're trying to decide which course they might want to go, public service or private practice. Well, I mean, it's a great question, and, you know, they are both rewarding ways to spend your legal career. Um, you know, I think if you have an opportunity at some point during your legal career to do public service, I would very much strongly encourage you to do it. Um, you know, I think that it is, you know, one way to really, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, if people in private practice focus a lot on doing, spending some part of their time working on pro bono, and I think that's, you know, a very worthy endeavor and is great. But I think if you look at your career as a whole, I think your time in public service is really, you know, very much pro bono service, and you're providing a very, you know, useful service to the to the government as a whole. And to the, uh, yeah, uh, Judge Taha back, back there is saying it's too darn close to pro bono, which is to say we're not getting paid. Um, but, um, but no, I, I really do think that it is, you know, something where you are giving back and you're giving back to the broader community. And I think, you know, it, it, it becomes very, very rewarding. And, um, and you, you, you know, everybody has cases where they see that more clearly than others. But you can have cases where, you know, I mean, I had cases where I was vindicating some of the major anti-discrimination statutes this country has. Um, and, you know, that was something that, you know, I mean, I felt very, very good about um, because I think that's one of the, you know, very important functions of the government and got to play a role uh, in that process. And so that was very, very rewarding. Private practice, you know, has its, um, its rewards as well. And, I mean, you know, and, and to be, you know, frank, some of them are financial. Um, I am paid slightly higher now than I was uh, in the Solicitor General's office. But some of them are also, you know, I, I mentioned this earlier, I mean, you know, you get a variety of, um, of opportunities in private practice. And sometimes, you know, I mean, I think, you know, I've had this opportunity in varying degrees earlier in my practice. I haven't really been back long enough for this to have happened this time around, where you are, you know, vindicating the rights of the individual against the government. And, you know, and that's, in a sense, that's why I think there's a lot to be said in, you know, doing both of these kinds of service because I, I guess it stands to reason in a legal system that's adversarial, um, you know, part of the way the system works, the, works correctly and gets to the right result is when you have talented lawyers 
you know, working both for the government and essentially against the government and defending the person whose individual rights are being adversely affected by the government. And I think it's also broadening for a lawyer to have some experience doing both. I think, you know, the government lawyer who's actually had the experience of representing the so-called little person um, and understands some of the institutional uh, advantages that the, that the government may have in litigation. You know, sovereign immunity is a tremendous asset to have. Um, and, uh, you know, I think they may be better at defending the government and also better at identifying the cases where maybe the government should pull back. But conversely, you know, I think, you know, people who've spent their whole career in private practice, they look at the government as this sort of monolith with unlimited resources. And at least in my experience, you know, on the average case, it's the other way around half the time. I mean, it's, you know, it's the government. Sure, if they brought the full force of the federal government to bear on a case, um, they would have unlimited resources. But in reality, it's one or two AUSAs who got a bunch of other cases and have some kids they're getting home to try to see. And it's the, 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 the private individual who's got a well-financed law firm that's got six or seven associates that they can throw at the case. So, I mean, I think having an opportunity to do both at the end of the day I think you'll look back at your career and really feel like that was the right way to do it. But Returning to the uh, combat captives, did you find that the issues are complicated by the fact that uh, it is probably harder now in some of our more recent situations to identify the status of a a person as compared to, well, let's say the Second World War uh, situation. And secondly, is the administration or the Supreme Court at all affected by uh, legal uh, decisions in other countries in, in comparable kinds of situation? Um, well, there are a couple of great questions. Let me try to answer them you know, reasonably concisely, which is to say, um, I do think that, you know, one of the things that really both the administration and the court had to struggle with in this current dispute, and one of the things that makes it different from a more traditional war, is precisely the difficulty in classification. Um, because, you know, in, 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 in most conflicts, most of the members of the enemy combatant force were wearing uniforms and you capture somebody wearing a German uniform, um, you know, it's, it's really not that difficult to say, all right, this person is a prisoner of war. Importantly, you, know, there, you had two things going for you. Once, first, because they were wearing the uniform, you knew they were an enemy combatant. And second, because they were wearing the uniform, you knew they were entitled to the protections of prisoner of war status. Now here, you know, most of the people you're, you're capturing are not wearing any kind of recognizable uniform. And interestingly, that sort of you know, makes it harder to figure out whether they're an enemy combatant at all. But if they are an enemy combatant at all, it makes it sort of easier to figure out that they're not entitled to the protections of prisoner of war status. And so you know, that's part of the dynamic um, that you know, is, as I think, frustrated uh, people on both sides of this debate. It's very, very difficult. You know, there's, you know, and there's a lot of people who, when they first look at the administration's policy, it was like, well, you know, why haven't you treated these people like prisoners of war? Why haven't you given them the benefits that prisoners of war have traditionally enjoyed? And, you know, that might, at the end of the day, be a reasonable compromise, but it's an odd compromise because the one thing that you can be pretty sure these people are not are, are, are people who are entitled to prisoner of war status because if they're combatants at all, they are certainly combatants who have not obeyed the, the laws of war themselves and so do not have any kind of privileged status as, an, as a prisoner of war. And so I think this difficulty in classification and identification is at the heart of some of the difficult issues. To answer the second part of your question, there is no doubt that some of the justices are very interested in what's being decided in other courts around the world, especially to the extent they're dealing with difficult issues. Of course, not all the justices are of the same mind as to how relevant that is. And, you know, Justice Breyer makes a very passionate case for the fact that, you know, as justices of the Supreme Court, we have these incredibly difficult questions. We have relatively little to guide us. Why wouldn't we look, at least take a peek, at the views of other courts that are wrestling with similar issues? Justice Scalia makes a pretty impassioned case. 
for the view that if, at least if it's the United States Constitution we're interpreting, I mean, it was a distinctive document and informed by a distinctive tradition and a rejection of at least a lot of things that were going on in the United Kingdom, why would we necessarily care how the House of Lords has resolved this issue? And I think, you know, they're both very respectable positions. I have to say from the perspective of an advocate, there's a sense in which you go with the least common denominator. If you have at least one justice up there who's pers potentially persuaded by foreign law sources, I think I would be doing a disservice to my clients if I wasn't willing to marshal arguments based on those foreign law sources. A little overwhelming to ask a question when you're surrounded by all these legal minds and you're only got a little by osmosis with a few lawyers in the family and reading John Grisham. <laughs> but uh, what I wondered is we're hearing now a lot about Congress perhaps in the House of Representatives wanting to bring Karl Rove up on the having fired the lawyers. Now I know that's coming out of the Attorney General's office. But in this case, would you be subject maybe to being called because of having been in office during this period? Um, the, the fortunate answer is no. Um, <laughs> because, I mean, you know, that really was something, I mean, that as a general matter, um, w you know, did not involve the, the office of the Solicitor General. And, you know, and, and, and it really, I mean, p brings up a broader point, which is, you know, the Solicitor General's office is physically located in the Justice Department. As I mentioned earlier, you know, the Solicitor General reports to uh, the, the Attorney General. But the function of the Solicitor General's office is very distinct, and it does sort of operate, you know, a little bit apart from the rest of the day-to-day -day operations of the Justice Department. So, you know, it's not inconceivable that the Attorney General could you know, talk to the Solicitor General and say, you know, are there any U.S. attorneys that are giving you just kind of crazy recommendations to appeal that they just don't seem to kind of get it? Um, but, you know, but, but that, that, that didn't happen, and it wouldn't happen in the normal course. I mean, we're sort of off doing our own, you know, function and, you know, that other, you know, uh, various operations of the Justice Department can, can end up going on sort of, you know, in the same building but without really directly involving us. Um, you know the, you know, and and I guess the only other thing I would say is that, you know, in in one thing that I'm sort of you know very kind of happy about in terms of my own tenure, but I think this is true of the SG's office more broadly, is you know we unlike you know a lot of the other parts of the Justice Department, we do interact with the U.S. Attorney community very directly, and we spend a lot of time telling the U.S. Attorney community no. Um, you know, there are a lot of instances with which a, US, a local U.S. attorney wants to appeal a case, and you know, they, you know, it's a district of Kansas, and they want to take a case up to the Tenth Circuit, and you know, and 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 they got to get approval from Washington, which probably chafes them a little bit. And then, you know, in some of the cases, for reasons of kind of broader legal concerns, you know, things that may have nothing to do with their particular case, but may have something to do with the way the law is developing out in the Ninth Circuit and the Third Circuit, we will tell them no. And, and notwithstanding the fact that there is this sort of obvious sort of source of friction, um, you know, administration in, administration out, you know, the U.S. Attorney's offices, I think, generally have a pretty high opinion of the Solicitor General's office, and I think that is because, you know, we really do try to, you know, do our best to kind of keep straight the differences between policy and law, between prosecutorial discretion, which really is primarily the business of the U.S. Attorney's, and, but there's a difference between whether the case should have been brought in the first instance and whether it should be appealed. And we try to do our best to keep those various lines clear. And I think because we do a pretty good job of that and historically have done a pretty good job of that, even though we're in a position where, you know, surely there have been, you know, unkind words said about a particular decision by a solicitor general vis-a-vis -a, -vis a local U.S. attorney's office, but I think in the main, the relationship between the two communities has been very strong and very cooperative, and there's a sense of, you know, sort of shared enterprise because those lines of authority are kept clear. And if we had... <clears throat> 
what's a lesson that you've learned from your first appearance in front of the Supreme Court up until your last? Well, I, what I would say, you know, in answer to that is, I guess there are a couple lessons I've learned. Um, one is there's no such thing as being overprepared for a Supreme Court argument. Um, you know, a second lesson is it does get easier. It, it doesn't get to the point where you don't get nervous or anything, but it does get easier. Um, and then a third thing I would say is that, you know, it really um, is, is very important in the Supreme Court of the United States in particular to try to front load your answers as much as possible. If there's a question that admits of a yes or no answer, and your answer is such that you'd like to give a yes answer but qualify it or a no answer and qualify it, you're very well served by saying yes, however, or no but, um, as opposed to humana, 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 comma, so yes, with that qualification. Because the nature of the Supreme Court dynamic is you're very likely to get interrupted before you get to the yes or no part if you don't start with it and you're very likely to get interrupted with something like, you know, counsel that does admit of a yes or no answer, why don't you give me one? Um, and you don't really want that dynamic. And, you know, and this is something, I guess it's something that you have to learn a little bit by doing because it is a little bit different than arguing in the Court of Appeals. And one of the things that's different is, you know, various Courts of Appeals have different standards as to quite how tightly they enforce the red light when the time is up for the counsel. But most of them are, are relatively more forgiving than certainly Chief Justice Rehnquist was, and still probably a little more forgiving than Chief Justice Roberts. And so if you have three judges asking questions of an advocate, and there's a certain understanding that if things really get going you know, fast and furious, you might be able to give the counsel a little extra time, I think judges are going to be you know, relatively patient uh, in letting you know, at least a lawyer who they think you know, sort of gets it answer the questions, and, and, and they're not going to be quick to sort of ask a new line of questions if they're concerned that one of their colleagues hasn't fully explored the line of questioning. Whereas in the Supreme Court, you have eight or nine justices instead of three asking questions, and the time limits are real time limits. And so as the lawyer, you know, you have much less time to answer because, you know, although the justice wants to give, you know, the justice who just asked the question, you know, the counsel some adequate opportunity to respond to that out of deference not to the counsel but to the colleague, that's um, pretty limited. I mean, you know, you, you don't get the 77 questions in 30 minutes by having a real long clock. And so, as, as, you know, as I, as I went on in this process, I think I really learned to appreciate the importance of just, you know, trying to crisply as possible get the answer out, add the qualification uh, later, and not, not do it the other way around. Yeah, I think we do maybe one more. Bill, is that good? Have a final question for Paul. Uh, during your tenure, tenure before the court, did you develop any superstitions other than the uh, moot court trial runs? And if not, um, did you know of like what's the most interesting superstition you'd heard of of other colleagues maybe before the court? Um, you know, I, I mean, I don't really think that I developed any superstition. You know, somebody else might be able to watch me and say, I, you know, come on, Paul, um, why do you always do that? I mean, you know, I, I mean, there was stuff that I would do pretty much uniformly, you know, when I was getting ready for, uh, when I was working on the weekend to get ready for cases. Um, you know, I would, I, I would typically listen to opera, you know, on, as I was getting ready because, you know, I don't know a lot of Italian, so I wasn't particularly tempted to hum along. And, you know, but I, I don't view that as a superstition, but somebody else might. Um, so I, you know, I don't really feel like I sort of, you know, d developed anything quite like that. Um, you know, I, I'd say that, that maybe because I don't bring um, anything to the podium, I became sort of fascinated by uh, what other lawyers would bring to the podium. Um, and, uh, you know, as particularly one of my colleagues in the SG's office, a tremendous lawyer, his name is Jeff Lampkin. I, not saying I have anything I wouldn't say to his face and haven't said to his face, but he would, um, for the arguments, he would um, open like a large manila folder, like a, a legal size manila folder. He would open it up and then he would develop this sort of flow chart of all the various questions he could be asked and all the various permutations of answers 
And I mean, you know, by the end of it, it looked like, I mean, like literally the, the formula for like atomic fission. It was so complicated. It was just unbelievable. And, and I think this was a very therapeutic and cathartic exercise for him. Um, and I think he felt really good about doing it and felt like when he was done, he was prepared. Um, but I, I mean, I would be shocked if he could have actually made heads or tails of that thing in the heat of the argument because it was the most complicated looking thing that I'd ever seen. So I was one, you know, and then the, I, I, one, you know, I saw one lawyer go up there and he had this huge binder, like this thick. And all it was, apparently, was all of the briefs in the case. And what I really liked about it, though, is you know, the, the briefs in the Supreme Court are pretty much uniformly, you know, there's certain briefs or certain colors. So the, you know, the, 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 the petitioner's brief on the merits is, 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 is blue, and the, and, the, and the respondent's brief is red, and so on and so forth. So he had all the briefs copied on paper that was the color of the cover of the brief. So there were all, you know, there's all, you could, you could look at it, it looked like sort of the rainbow as you looked at the side of the binder, the red pages, the blue pages. So, you know, I always got a kick out of those kind of things. And like I said, I don't, I don't fault people for it. I think if it makes them feel better, that's great. But, um, but it is kind of fun to watch what they bring up there. All right, well, why don't we uh, join in thanking Paul for his visit to the University of Kansas.